guys, welcome to this week's Q&A out here on the Z-Boat. We're going to get right into it. This week's question is from TCDC Bryce. Thanks for watching the show. Why do you guys run your spinnaker without your main? That's a good question. The reason I do it is because I'm a lazy sailor and really I'm not much of a sailor at all. I just like running an ASIM out there and not having to deal with the main. The main can sometimes block the ASIM because we're running so far downwind. And, it, and, and when we're running slow like that and there's any kind of swell, it can cause uh, the boom to flop back and forth. And obviously you put a boom preventer on there, but then the sail flogs and, and it's just a big beating. So we don't like to run it and we don't gain that much by running it. So that's a great question. I hope that answers your question. The Great Lazarus. Thank you for watching the show, The Great Lazarus. You asked, do we ever see any UFOs? Do we ever see any underwater, uh, unidentified underwater objects and stuff like that? Well, I tell you, the other morning I woke up and I rolled over and saw Renee next to me and she was unidentifiable. It was scary. She started looking at me funny. Yeah, she loves me. I know all you women out there thinking I'm a man, a woman hater, but I love my wife dearly, dearly. No, we, on to the question, the great Lazarus. You know, the skies out here are beautiful, lit up at night in the South Pacific when there's no clouds, and I haven't seen anything yet, and I love science fiction, I love science, I love, uh, I hope that there's something out there in the clouds, and we're always looking for something in the water, we're always looking for things out there, so... But as of today, we have not seen anything strange in the skies. We haven't seen anything strange in the water. Now, when I get in the water with my thong on, that's unidentifiable. And sometimes the whalers from Japan come over and they want to they wanna bleed me for fat. But other than that, that's all we got out there. Once again, thanks for watching, the Great Lazarus. Moving right along. All right, the next question is from Sharna Foreman, 70, 17. Are we going to keep sailing once our kids leave the boat? And I believe that we will. We like living on the boat. We like the life out here on the water. We can change scenery very quickly. We can go somewhere we hadn't been. We like the warm weather. We like cold weather too. We like skiing and snow and stuff. But uh, we like living under the water. There's, there's so many places underwater that haven't been explored. So many things you can see where very few humans have had an impact or ever seen or touched. So it's very, I love being under the water. I love kiting. I love I love just anything on the water. I, I enjoy that. I don't so much enjoy sandy beaches. I, I'm not a sandy beach guy. I don't like sand all over me. It gives me a rash. Hollywood is so irresponsible. You see a couple making love on the beach. Well, they're getting sand all over themselves. That romance is not there. Me and Renee have tried it. It's <laughs> not there. She's going, ah, I'm getting sand. I'm getting off the towel. Oh, the sand on the towel. Oh, can you tell? Uh, hey, let's just call this quits. Oh, I got sun blocking my eyes. It's burning. And now there's sand and the sun blocking is sticking to my eyes. And then the romance is gone. So we'll continue sailing. But, you know, the sandy beaches have become less and less because we just had bad experiences on sandy beaches. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, on to the next one. The next one is pipes louder than your girl. All right, pipes louder than your girl. Ask the question. How do we know where to check in, what to check in, where to go to get re to provision and all those kind of things every time we go to a different country? Because there is a resource online called Noon Sight. N O O N S I T E. Go there, and they have the the regulations, the rules to every country in the world. Just about every country you'd want to go to anyway. And, and all the formalities, all the check-in procedures, all the resources, local resources, they're a very good organization and uh, a great website and a great resource for all us cruisers out there. And they keep it up to date, so it's, it's really nice. Check that out. Also, when we're in bays and, and local anchorages, there's generally always a, a uh, radio net in the, in the morning. And the radio net is basically... Uh, Everybody on their VHF uh, radios, there's somebody who heads it up and tells all the local resources of the town or the village that you're by, the island or activities that are going on, and that's a great way to figure out where things are at and what things are doing. So once again, louder than your pipes, girl. Or no, wait. Pipes louder than your girl. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Thanks for watching the show. In the last uh, six months, guys, we've had a lot of new subscribers come on board, and we want to thank everybody for taking time out of their day to watch our show. We know your time is important to you, and, and the fact that you take time to watch our program, is uh, it means a lot to us, and it's very humbling to us. So we, we're just very honored that you take the time to watch us. Also, check out our website. It's kind of been dormant for a while, but we've been updating that. It's uh, sailingzatara.com or thetalent.com right here. If you want to see more of me, life-size posters, go to, our, go to our website, check it out, sailingsattire.com. You can find out all our gear on there. Anything we use on the boat, you can buy there. I know it's pandering. We're trying to sell you something. We're not really trying to sell you something. It's just a lot of people want to know what kind of gear we have, where we get that gear, 
and uh, we have affiliate links to Amazon and they throw us a couple of pennies. It doesn't cost you anymore, but they throw us a couple of pennies for, for uh, doing a little marketing for Jeff Bezos because he doesn't have enough money. And uh, I've tried to get him to adopt me. He won't do that yet, but maybe now that he got a divorce, he might adopt me. Who knows? And one other new development on, on, on the website is Renee has called, created a little blog out there called uh, Sister Wives. Now, no, we're not Mormons, but uh, I've thought about four or five Bond girls. <laughs> As my wife laughing in the background. Oh. I know, she's the only Bond girl I need. Anyway. He couldn't handle more than one woman. I couldn't handle, I don't, there's not enough medication in the world for me to handle another woman. It's for, for women, for sailing women, for women who are fixing to go sailing with their husband, and they just don't know what to do with that madman. He's got it in his head to go out on the water, and he's willing to drag her and the kids with her. And Renee gives some good advice for uh, women fixing to go sailing or already sailing out there with their husbands, and they want to kill their husbands. I just want to go back to my room. Guys and girls, we want to thank you all for watching the show. It means a lot. Hey guys, welcome to this week's edition of the Q&A. We're going to roll right into talking about fishing. In, the, in this last episode that you just watched, you watched us catching some draw and they were good. You know, we got a lot of hate comments on our fishing videos because people say I don't know how to kill a fish. I have tried everything in the world to kill a fish. I've stabbed them through the eyeballs, stabbed them in the head, poured alcohol in their gills. You know, you guys will see me with a little squirt bottle or, or an alcohol, pouring alcohol into their gills. I've tried it all. Fish flop, fish crank out all over the place and that's just the way they are uh, sometimes I'm lucky enough to gaff them right through their brain and it kills them dead but most of the time these fish are you know I don't I, I try to kill them quick I've got screwdrivers I've pounded them through the head with screw you guys see me use a bat you know how good I am at that but yeah we try to be humane when we're killing fish we try to get them killed quickly and uh, you know, we don't use a net. A lot of people say, why don't you get a net? One of the reasons we don't use a net is because we are normally sailing. We don't stop the boat. Dropping a big net into the water would just rip it out of our hands because the water going by the boat would just grab it and just rip it out of the water. So a gaff is, and you noticed in the last video, I've got a bigger gaff. I've had that gaff for a long time, and that's helped a bunch with landing those fish as well. Hope you enjoyed the fishing segments, and uh, we're going to start right off with a question from Mr. Gary C. And Gary asks about hole slap. On, on a catamaran and all catamarans are going to have hole slap especially when the seas are on the beam and the waves go underneath the so if the seas are here and here's your two holes and this is probably a bad analogy and the seas are coming this way or coming this way they go into the first hole and then they slap against the second hole most of the time at least that's the way it is on our boat and friends of ours boats I don't know that you can get rid of hole slap. You get used to it after a while, but sometimes it can be really thumping and loud, and you'll think, well, Lee, what just broke? But catamarans are made to deal with that, and so we've learned to uh, deal with it. And But most of the time, when you, you'll have that hole slap when you have beam seas or seas that aren't on the, you know, following seas and, and stuff like that. Gary, I want to thank you for watching the channel, and that's a great question. Okay, Mr. Robert M. Rubano, you asked me about the B&G and why I went with B&G. Well, first of all, thanks for watching the show. I went with B&G because I like their selling platform. I like all their selling stuff that they have integrated. B&G is a great selling platform. Simrad is the same company, but Simrad is their motor boat division. I went with B&G because that's what I like the best. I've been with Ray. I've seen Ray Marine. I've seen Garmin. I've seen a lot of different things. But when it comes to the sailing, uh, the sailing capabilities of the B&G, I really like the B&G. And I was using it on my old boat. It was easy to install. Interacts well with Wi-Fi networks, so, so I liked it all. Thanks for watching the show, and that's a great question. All right, the next question is from Mr. Jet Bot. Jet Bot, thanks for watching the show. And he asks, did you guys opt for the H5000 CPU on the B&G system? Yes, we did. I wanted the best tech money could buy for our boat. I wanted the best, the latest, greatest, because, you know, you buy this stuff and, you know, a year later, it's they got something new out on the market. So I wanted the best stuff. The, uh, the H5000 and all that stuff is super highly configurable for racing. Or like if the winds come up, you can you can program it to tell it to do what you want to do. If the winds come up or if the winds shift, it'll automatically steer your boat a certain way. It'll fall off the wind. It'll push into the wind. So it can do a lot of different things. I don't use a lot of those functionalities because I'm not a racer. But it's a really great system, and it's it's very user friendly and so we like that so yes we did have the h5000 and i want to thank you for watching the show and asking the questions once again guys. hey guys welcome to this week's edition of the q a we're going to jump right in there with a question from mr r pier 83 how does the salt from the water affect your electronics do you use special cases well, that's a great question mr pierre and 
they do. Salt water is corrosive and the humidity out here affects everything. You really need, if you're going to have hard drives, cameras, electronic devices, you really need to store those things. And a friend of mine just showed me those while we was in Hapai. He had a box, it was almost like a humidor, only it was the opposite. It takes all the humidity out of the air and it keeps a, it's a dry refrigerator basically, but it, it, it's a drying thing and it keeps everything super dry and takes all the moisture out of the thing. We constantly have to spray connections down. We have some WD-40 contact cleaner and we're constantly spraying electrical connections where computers hook up, where phones hook up, where cameras hook up, where the contacts get corrosion on them and they start to get uh, all kinds of salt water. So yes, salt water is very tough on things and uh, can cause lots of corrosion. So you really gotta take care to keep the salt off and the humidity out of your electronics. Once again, thanks for watching. Next question coming to you is from Mr. Obadul Hassan. We want to thank you for watching the show, Mr. Hassan. You asked, this is my first watch of your channel's videos. I am a new subscriber. I have one question. What is the most important moral thing that you have learned from the sea that you have on land? Well, once again, great question. Deep, deep question. And I like to answer that by saying that um, there's so many things we've learned. We've learned not to take for granted the time that we have with our children, the time that we have with, with, with each other. And the sea and being out here on the ocean has given us the time to focus on our kids and to focus on our ch each other. Me and Renee, we have some knockdown, drag out fights. We get fired up at each other. We throw books at each other. <laughs> we get to where she goes out to the menstrual dinghy once or <laughs> twice a week. No, I'm just kidding. But in all honesty, we, we, we're not the perfect couple. We have problems just like everybody else. But the boat brings us back together because we'll be sitting there at times when we don't like each other very much or we don't like our children very much. And we'll think, what would life be like on land? What would it be like? How, how would it be for us? And it wouldn't be good. This makes us focus on our problems. It makes us focus on making our problems go away. It, it makes us focus on building a better relationship. Because you can't run and hide. You have to deal with your problems. And you have to get them out of the way. And you can't let bitterness eat you up. And me and Renee and the kids, we're guilty of holding on to bitterness and resentment and letting that stuff fester instead of truly letting it go and letting it float away. As you're watching this video, we had that big cell, uh, cell failure. And we have a lot of things like that that happen where our children are put in positions where they have to deal with emergency situations, where they have to deal with things with cool heads, calmness, and I have to be calm. Even though I may be yelling loud, it's, I'm yelling loud so they can hear me. I'm not yelling at them. I'm just talking really loud so everybody can hear because the wind's blowing 100 mile an hour and, and you're trying to get things done. But our children get to experience real life situations where on land we wouldn't have that we, we we wouldn't have those real life situations you know there's never a fire drill on land when's the last time your children had to deal with a situation where your 17 year old 18 year old daughter had to drive a boat while their dad and her her brother's out on deck trying to mess with a sail that's blowing and, and knocking and, and going everywhere and Everybody's working together as a team. So it's really just made us great with teamwork as a family and analyzing the situation and not making stupid decisions. Sure, we still make dumb decisions, but it's just really brought us together as a family and it's shown my children how to solve problems, how to find solutions, how to be calm in the midst of a storm. It'll be interesting to see how this helps my children later in life or hurts them out there. I don't know how it's gonna be. But what, you know, once again, that's a great question and you know, I, I rambled on a lot about that, but that's just where I'm at with it and where me and Renee are at with it. And and we appreciate you watching the show and, and we hope you continue. And we want to thank all you guys out there for watching our show. If you like what you're seeing, hit that subscribe button. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Q&A session back here on the Z-Boat. We've got some good questions and answers for you this week. We're going to get right into it. This week's Q&A starts with Mr. Stephen Cooksey. He emailed us. Thanks for watching the show, Stephen. Uh, he's Royal Navy Submarine Service, and he's asking, do we have the skills to handle emergencies, uh, health emergencies, physical emergencies out here on the boat? That's a great question, Stephen. And yes, we do have a few skills. I grew up on a ranch and uh, in, in, ca in the cattle industry, and so uh, working on cattle all the time, doctoring cattle, sewing up cattle, uh, suturing and that kind of stuff, I think I could do that. I hadn't had to do that on my kids yet or myself. But I think that in an emergency, I could probably end with a phone or a sat phone. I could talk to a doctor and I could make it work. We carry a medical kit on board to do just those things. 
and uh, I wouldn't want to. I mean, stitching up some a, a major cut or setting a broken arm, I could do that all day long. But uh, you know, like an appendix ruptured or something like that, I, I'd have to get on the phone, and then I'd, I wouldn't want to do that unless I really, really had to. On our website, Renee goes into uh, on her blog about health insurance, what we do, where we do it, and how we get health insurance, and how we deal with doctors and medical stuff overseas and out of out of the country and where we're at. So that might help you out. Go over to um, settingsguitar.com, check those blogs out. And, Good information. Once again, Stephen, thanks for watching the show. All right, and then next question coming up here is from uh, Miss Autumn Rose, and we appreciate the email, Autumn. And you ask, what do we do with our trash when we're on the sea for a couple of months? Well, the first thing we do is we grind all the plastic up and we put it in the water. <laughs> oh, that's gonna go over well. I'm kidding. I am so kidding. We do not do that. We take all the biological trash that goes overboard, anything that can decompose, paper, um, uh, food stuff, anything can decompose goes overboard. Anything that's got plastic glue or stuff like that in it, it goes into a, a, a plastic bag, obviously, and we store that plastic bag until we get to some country where we can dump it on them and uh, load their landfills up with our trash and, and just really help them out a little bit. We try not to buy a lot of trash that you know when we're buying groceries and we're provisioning we try not to buy stuff that has a lot of trash impact or that, that accumulates in trash we, we're very sensitive to that because you have limited space on the boat and we are a little bit environmentally sensitive so we just don't want to just plague the environment and the oceans with a bunch of unnecessary stuff so i hope that answers your question autumn and thanks for watching the next question is from royal monkey is it fun having other ships to sell with and does it ever get stressful whenever you don't have another ship to sail with? Well, that is a great question. We love buddy boating. We love sailing with other boaters. It's comforting when we're sailing in, in waters that we're not sure about to have have other boaters there. We like to go in herds. You know, when we're doing major passages, it's nice to have another boater out there for security. If you have a breakdown or something goes wrong, it's nice to know you got some buddy boats in range that if you need help or they need help, you guys can rescue each other or help each other out in need. So that, that is comforting. Now when it comes to being sitting on anchor and tying up and you've got four or five buddy boats around, all the politics that, that you have on land, they kick in in high gear. You know, we, we come out here to get away from all that drama, all that clickishness. You know, there's a lot of clicks out here. And, and it's no different than land. The same thing on land. And, and then that is a little disappointing. You'll find boats where the kids really get along and then the parents just don't have much in common. So a lot of people don't like hanging out with us. I'm not politically correct and I don't like small talk. I press buttons because I want to see where people stand. I want to see what they believe in. I want to know who they are. But other than that, that's not what the question was about. The question was, do we like it? And, and it's, it can be political at times. It can be drama at times, and it can be hard. And yeah, the kids, the kids can be drama. You know, uh, the, the little girls is just drama, drama, drama with little girls most of the time. The boys are not so bad. But we've seen more drama with the little girl relationships than we ever have anything else. And I think that would be the same on land. We try to find people we have something in common with. Basically, at Bulls Down, you have two types of boat boaters out here. You have the boaters that uh, like to do the land stuff, land exploration, and then you have the boats that love the water and being in the water and under the water. And we're the boats who like to be under the water and on top of the water kiting or, or diving. So that divides a lot of boats up because a lot of boats aren't geared with scuba kits and kites and, and that kind of stuff. And they're just not active boats when it comes to those kind of activities. And then the other thing that divides boats is you have your drinking boats where happy hour is the main thing and then you have the boats who are not big drinkers and we don't have anything against drinking or having a good time but it's just one of those things that separate people and and, and, and groups of people and, and groups of people tend to hang out with what they like to do and then we're the same way probably but uh Hope that answers your question, and, and that gives you a little insight to buddy boats and uh, what you have to deal with out here in buddy boats. And every once in a while, you get a psycho boat, and you get the psycho families, and, and you got to watch out for them because they'll get you. All right, guys. Hey, if you like the show, hit the guys. Then today, I'm talking about weather in our New Zealand crossing. It can be a hairy crossing, and it can be a, an easy crossing, depending on the weather. And as I'm looking at Predict Wind here, I've downloaded all their models. We're looking for a window out around 10, 15 days from now, and we need seven days for the passage. And what happens is, is you look at, if you if you look on the map here, as I scroll through this, this is where we're at, and that would be leaving today if you see the lines up there. But what happens is, is you see the winds are in our favor on a beam reach as we head down, if we left today, as we head down to New Zealand. And it would be a pretty good crowd. Of course, they get pretty hairy down there at the end if we left today. But what we're looking for is out there, because we're not going to leave today, we're looking at the 14th through the 15th. So as you can see, the winds, when we start, if we left on the 15th, 
are on our nose and they're on our nose and they're on our nose so that's not a good window out there so as we we keep rolling we just keep looking for a good window the kind of window we want is the one we you would see today if I was leaving today I I can't though because of kitty cat issues but the window I'd like is the one today is the winds all on the beam all the way down there all the way down there then it even on the tail a little bit I think it's a little hot there but then we're right there so as you can see that's a that's a good weather window if we left today but out there at the 15th or 13th that's when we're looking and right now it doesn't look like a good weather window and you can see these lows and, and storms rolling off the coast of Australia and that's what we have to watch out for so that's what we're looking for there it's about a thousand miles let's go over here to tables and summary it's about a thousand eighty five miles to Opua that's where we want to make landfall in New Zealand and uh, this is saying if we left today it would take us uh, six days to get down there that's pretty quick and uh, reaching and downwind is most of it and the waves would be two to three meter waves 50 percent of the time and one to two meter waves 48 percent of the time and those waves are probably right on the nose most of the time it's the swell coming out of the south pacific out of the southern ocean so that's what we're looking at and uh, you know obviously we're aiming for a place called john's corner if you look on avionics here that waypoint number one right there is john's corner it's 174 east and, and 30 south is where we're headed and then that gives us a, an angle from the winds that come from the south to come across and and uh, hit us on a beam we're sitting here in Muscat Cove looking for that weather window and we want a good weather window. We don't want to get hammered. We also are under insurance restrictions. I have to be south of 30 by November 1st or my insurance won't cover me if a named tropical storm hit us and did damage to us, insurance wouldn't cover me. So for those of you who don't understand what I'm saying when I say 30, that's 30 south latitude. 30 south latitude, 174 longitude is uh, GPS coordinates and that's what they call John's Corner. And that's kind of been the trademark or way of, of cruisers going from Fiji down to New Zealand this time of year. They, they aim for that point, and it gives you the option of doing things with the winds depending on where the winds go. So that's what we're looking at. And this is where we're going in uh, Opua. We're going right down here to Opua to uh, Bay of Islands Marina right here. I've zoomed in on it. And that's where we're going to go is Bay of Islands. So in the next 15 or 20 days, we need a weather window to open up. And we need to have a good weather window, a safe weather window to get down there. And we're, and we're doing this every day. We're looking at these weather windows. I look at this model every day. I look at all the models on Predict Wind. And I'll go, that's the PWG model on Predict Wind. Now here's the PWE model for 14 days out. And I'll just scroll through it. And I'm not looking to leave before the 13th or 15th. So right there you can see a low on the PWE model spinning off of the coast of Australia. And heading towards, and then it just d dissipates. So that model there, actually... If you left on the 11th or 12th, that model there might be pretty good, or the PWE model. But we don't want to just go off of one model. We want to have several models that line up. So if we look back on the 10th, and we go forward from the 10th, that's a good sailing out of Fiji. Kind of light winds, kind of light winds. Then we get a little wind on the nose there. And you can see something building off the coast of Australia there, and it's starting to head our way. And you can see that is lightening up as it gets there. So that might be a good window too. So GFS lines up with our PWE model. And then this one don't go out far enough, the European model. But let's look if we left on the 9th or 10th. That one's looking pretty good too. You see that low spin in there, big low right there. And it's just kind of dissipating as it passes over. So we need to see that develop a little more. And now let's just look at the wave and look at the swell there. So the PWG swell shows, uh, from the 10th on, shows some pretty good swell up here north. That's uh, 3.2 meters at 7 seconds. That's going to be a little rough. But unfortunately, that swell's behind us. And then it's on our nose around the 17th or 8th. It's kind of light and variable. So we're going to start looking at that 10th, 11th window, maybe the 12th window of leaving here and hooking it on down to uh, New Zealand. Episode 100. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Q&A. Before we get started on that, we are in New Zealand right now. Right now we happen to be sitting in Opua in the Bay of Islands Marina. Beautiful place down here. We're going to be moving down to Marston Cove and we are going to do a meetup with everybody who wants to hook up with us down here. But it's going to be when we get back from the holidays. So it'll be around the end of, uh, it'll be around the first, second, third week of March when we get back here. 
So we'll put that out there on the social media sites when we decide to, when we get back and we get ready to do the, the, the meetup. Now let's dive right into the Q&A. The first question out of the box is from Mr. Brian Jackson. He asks, uh, are the U.S. Virgin Islands a good place to hike, fish, scuba dive, snorkel, and all those kind of things? Well, that's a good question, Brian. Uh, yeah, they are. They're a really good place for diving. Uh, the Spanish Virgin Islands, uh, all the islands off the coast of Puerto Rico are really nice. Uh, great fishing, great lobstering, all that kind of stuff right in there. Now, I've never really done a lot of hiking in the in the in the U.S. Virgin Islands, so I wouldn't know about that. But uh, it's a great place to do a lot of diving. If I had my druthers of uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands and, and the Caribbean there or the Bahamas, I would go to the Bahamas. But I don't know that you can charter a boat in the Bahamas. But the Bahamas is. Probably one of my favorite places on the planet so far besides Tonga. Anyway, Brian, we appreciate you watching the show, and thanks for the question. So the next question is from Marina Batham. Do you leave your eggs out? Well, that depends. If we buy cold eggs, refrigerated eggs, we have to put those in the refrigerator. But if you buy eggs that are warm, that have never been refrigerated, you can leave those out as long as you turn them over. And you keep turning them over every day or so, so the air pocket on the top of them doesn't start to get nasty. And then when you do get your eggs going, we always have a separate bowl, so we crack an egg in that bowl and make sure it's good and then we put it into the bowl where all the good eggs are because every once in a while you crack a bad egg you don't want that uh, ruining all your uh, good eggs that you have. Marina thanks for watching the show and moving right along. Next question is from Mr. David Potter. It's awesome cooking this episode and I have not watched them all yet. Is cooking done by gas? So far I have not seen any reference to how easy it is to get etc. Just wondering. Alright good question David. We, we use propane on our boat. Some boats are fully electric, but ours is propane, and we like having that diversity of propane because if your electrical system goes down and your boat's all electric, then you're going to have a hard time cooking. So we have an electric oven, and we have a gas stove. Propane's easy to find. It's propane or butane. You want to have both kind of cans because in some place, U.S. cans are normally easy to fill, but you want to have the fittings to go with you that you can take and, and they can adapt those fittings to fill your tank. But never have we had a problem getting tanks filled. It's just making sure that whoever's doing the filling has the right fittings. The tanks have got to be inspected. A lot of people, especially in the developed countries, will not fill a tank that isn't stamped right. They don't fill fiberglass tanks. They don't like messing with those new fiberglass composite tanks and stuff like that. So uh, good, aluminum, uh, uh, good aluminum cylinders are the best kind that have uh, inspection stamps on them and all those kind of stuff that you need on there. David, we want to thank you for the question and thanks for watching the show. All right, next question is from Kate Coles. And she asked, did someone, i got to put my old man glasses on, did someone write your theme song for you and how did, how did that come about? Well, Kate, thanks for watching the show. That song is from an artist called uh, Grabbits and we found that song on Monster Cat. Monster Cat is a subscription-based uh, service that offers uh, non-copyrighted and copyrighted music that you have to pay for licenses to use that music. And we just were randomly browsing that and that's where we found that. It's uh, Music is a tough thing on a YouTube channel. It's tough to find uncopyrighted music. And so that's the, one of the, that's one of the tough things that Renee's really good at is finding good music that works in our channel. Okay, we want to thank you for watching and thanks for the question. The next question is from Kyla McClellan. She wants to know, your adventure must have felt like a grand vacation at least in the beginning. Do you feel like you're on holidays holidays every day? Well, that is a good question. And I tell you, uh, Kyla, that is, uh, it's not a vacation out here. Not even close to a vacation. I mean, everybody who watches YouTube, you, you, you get this impression that we're out here sailing and it's paradise. I and mean, we're obviously not working a nine to five job, but it is a lot of work out here. And, and it's, it's uh, adjusting and adapting to this lifestyle out here will require a lot of sacrifice from, from the things you're used to and you take for granted on land. So it, it's not a vacation. There are times where you're not working, but I'm constantly always trying to improve the boat, work on the boat, or or uh, we're provisioning or we're looking at weather. And, and it's just, it's different. It's, it's not a vacation though. I wouldn't call it a vacation. If you could come out here and not have to worry about weather and you could sail around a few little islands and you could just do that and then get off the boat and somebody else manage and take care of the boat, that might be a vacation, but it's it's not like a vacation. It's just an alternate lifestyle choice. You know, we're not young and in our 20s anymore, and, and so it's not just easy. It's it's uh, It does require a lot of work from us, and it requires a lot of uh, preparation. So once again, Kyla, I hope that answers your question, and thanks for watching the show. All right, next question out of the box comes from Raphael Tarantini. Our question is, knowing what you know today and looking back 10 years, would sailing earlier with a smaller 
catamaran and a smaller budget and a young family, children less than 10, be a good idea? Well, that's a great question. And I tell you, from my personal experience and for the children's enjoyment, I think the perfect age for kids to really enjoy this lifestyle is from about eight years old to about 15 or 16. That's the perfect age where kids want to be adventurous, where they're, they're willing to go and explore and they're, they're interested in all things life. Younger children, I haven't had young kids on the boat less than 10 years old, but I would think younger kids on the boat, they would be, they're not going to know any different. It's just going to be their life. It's going to be normal to them and they'll probably take that for granted one day. The older the kids get, the more they want to start spreading their wings and going on their own way, such as Anna. And, and so they... It just depends on your children, but I would say that uh, a smaller budget, that's just personal preference or, or wherever you're at in your life. Uh, a smaller boat, once again, that's a preference thing. I don't think a smaller boat or a bigger boat matters, but I think the age of the children, for you guys to truly enjoy cruising out here and a long-term cruising lifestyle, I, I don't know that I'd want to, I, I could do it, but I don't know that I'd want to do it with children who were really small, not, not because it's unsafe, because it's very safe, but just because you can't ever leave what you're doing. You're, you're raising children, you're, you're taking care of children and, and that kind of stuff. So I, I hope that answers your question. And uh, once again, Raphael, thanks for watching the show. All right, the next question is from Peter Van 1724 also known as uh, Jonathan. Jonathan asks, what is the biggest, I can't even hardly read guys. What is the biggest struggle on a huge passage? Well, the biggest struggle on a passage for our family is just boredom. A lot of boredom. It gets, uh, you know, on long passages, you can only read so many books. You can only lay in bed so much. And you can only sit there and be non-active for so many days before it starts to really wear on you. And we call it the passage blues. We get the passage blues on a long passage and, and you start to get, you know, down in the dumps. Because once again, we are not sa we're not sailors, nor do we claim to be professional sailors. You know, there's a lot of a lot of YouTubers out there, there's a lot of bloggers out there that are all professional sailors. We're not that. We enjoy traveling, we enjoy living on a boat, but the sailing part is not a, not a big aspect to us. So once again, the biggest struggle is boredom and inactivity and not, not being able to go swimming, not being able to uh, go underwater and do things. And, and, and that creates the passage blues, what we call passage blues. And uh, you know, a lot of people like them. True sailors love being on passage. They love being out in that ocean and they, they like it. And it may be just because we're burned out. I mean, we've put 30,000 nautical miles on in the last two and a half years. That's a lot of passage making. It's just really burned us out right now. And I may not feel that way in another year. We're going to take about four months off and just uh, live on the boat or, or go back to the States. But uh, I may look at it differently next year when I've had some time off of sailing. And uh, but that's a great question. So uh, once again, Peter Pan, 1724, or Jonathan, thank you for the question and thanks for watching the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Q&A. We're going to crank right in there first of all. First one is from Robert Adams, Metal Detecting. He asks, do you have the BNG Ford looking sonar? Do you think it would help you see a sunk shipping container in time to avoid it? Well, great question, Robert. And I tell you, I do have the B&G Ford looking sonar. I have not used it yet. Talking about shipping containers, you know, everybody saw that movie, All Those Lost with Robert Redford, and everybody's worried about shipping containers. Now, some the chance of hitting a shipping container is about the equivalent of hitting a well. People hit wells. They do hit shipping containers from time to time, but that is a very, very rare, rare chance that that would happen. We sell 30,000 miles, knock on wood. We haven't hit anything. We haven't seen shipping containers. We've seen a lot more wells than shipping containers. But uh, great question. I, and I'm going to use that forward looking sonar. I just haven't uh, ran it yet to, to use it because it sticks down out of the bottom of the boat. And, and uh, I want to use it. I just haven't been in a place to really use it where I was thinking about it. But once again, thanks for watching the show, Robert. And we're going to move right along to the next question. Next question coming out of the box is from Mr. David Miller. Hi guys, of the six of you, who is the best sailor? Brief and to the point. All right, the best sailor obviously is me. The, the talent. Me. Right here. Anna. The best sailor, right here. Anna. You're looking at him. Number one. I'm Anna. Gonna, hey, Anna is number <laughs> two on that list, possibly three, depending on the way she comes back. <laughs> now I'm having to train Jack, Finn, and Kate now to be great sailors. And you know what? The reality is, David. None of us are very good sailors at all, to be honest with you. They're good helpers, I'm a, and I help them, they help me, but we don't pride ourselves on being a good sailor because we're, we're just not sailors. We're not purists. We don't do the 
pure sailing thing. It's not it's not something that we do and, and who we are. We, we use the boat to get from point A to point B and it's a tool for us to do that. And so we're not racers or any of those kind of things. So, but that's a great question. And Anna probably works the hardest out here for me on the boat. And, you know, obviously Renee works hard at these YouTube videos and putting lots of hours in editing and cutting up film. But uh, yeah, Anna's my, my go-to girl when we're doing something that requires a cool mind. Anna's always on top of it. Jack's right there too. He's always doing the muscle work for me. Anna's doing the driving the boat stuff, so that's what we do. Yeah, but really, it's me. Great question, David. <laughs> Thanks for watching the show. Moving on to the next one. Next question coming out of the box is Mr. from Mr. Brian Seifert Hoyle. Brian, I want to thank you for watching the show. And your question is basically this. When we're at port and we provision, what are the important essentials that we like to get for... Uh, for uh, long passages, what, what do we want to have on the boat? And number two, what is our favorite fish to catch and eat? Well, I'll answer the last one first and the first one last. I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> and I did it right. That was a chron chronologically right. My English was right on the money there. I mean, I'm going to pat myself on my back. Anyway, uh, great question, Brian. My favorite fish to eat is uh, Dorado, Mahi Mahi, or dolphin fish. Those are the three names of that species. Wahoo is my second favorite. I love Wahoo just as much as I like Dorado. So that's what we try to catch. Tuna. We ate so much tuna, I think, on the first trip across. I just got burnt out on tuna. Everybody out here loves tuna and sushi. They like the sushi and they like to eat the raw fish and sushi. I'm not a raw fish guy. We're going to cook that fish. We're going to soak that fish and all kinds of other things to make it taste like chicken. <laughs> Items that you must get on long passages. Well, first of all, long passages, you want to stock up as much fruit and vegetables, fresh stuff as you can before you leave port, knowing that's going to go bad. And so the first three or four days, you're eating all your fresh fruits, your fresh vegetables. And, and, and like we have lots of deep freezers on the boat because we like frozen vegetables like uh, uh, broccoli and, and green beans and peas and, and stuff like that. So we like to have greens in our, in our diet, not just processed food. And then Obviously, you got to stock up your stuff that's going to last long term, like noodles or different things like that, and, and, and lentils and beans and, and all that kind of stuff. So, thanks for watching the show, Brian. And we appreciate the question. So, the next question is from Gilson Kata, Katayama. And their question to me is What air compressor do you use to fill up scuba tanks? And is it dangerous to have an explosion on board during the operation? Well, we hadn't had an explosion so far. We use a, our, the scuba compressor we use is called a Bauer Junior compressor. Is that right? Bauer Junior. Yes. Yeah, it's a Bauer Junior. And we've had that compressor for three years. I filled up hundreds and, I mean, at least hundreds of tanks because all the buddies that we boat with don't have compressors. So I got to fill their tanks up too. And that's the, that's the love of having your own compressor. Everybody wants you to fill tanks. I ought to charge five or ten dollars a tank. They bring their tanks over, we start filling. But, uh, yeah, it's a great little compressor. Works really good. They're not paying me to say that. I've had to pay for that compressor, and it's been a great little compressor. And uh, we've never had an explosion. Uh, those little compressors have a bypass on them, so if they get too full, it bypasses. And also, keeping your tanks inspected and your, your scuba tanks inspected in good shape and not overfilling them, that's a big deal. So, Gilson, thanks for watching. Thanks for the question. And hey, guys, if you like the show, click the like button, as I always say. Click the subscribe button, hit the little bell, you'll get notified of all the episodes and when they come out, and share it with your friends on Facebook, share it with your friends on uh, Instagram, share it with your wives and girlfriends, and uh, or boyfriends, whatever you have out there. I look forward to seeing you guys out there on the water.